her research interests relate to the nexus between higher education and development, specifically transforming universities for a changing climate. She is part of the Climate University Project at the Center for Education and International Development. The project aims to support local action on climate change in, among other countries, Brazil, Fiji, and Kenya, through the creation of participatory action research groups in universities. Part of the work involves assessing uh, the existing coverage of climate change in curricula, research, and community engagement activities of universities in the four countries. Palace's research has also explored public good role of universities in South Africa. This area of her work formed part of a four year country, a four country case study of universities in Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. She further contributed to a book chapter on the conceptual underpinnings of the SDG 4 indicator on quality education. Among her recent publications is Indicators of Higher Education and Public Good in Africa, a dashboard approach, co-authored and forthcoming in the Journal of Higher Education in Africa. Our discussant for today will be Dr. Timi Ntawa, is a our, one of our postdoctoral researchers at the University of the Free State's um, Higher Education and Human Development Research Group. Dr. Tawa's academic and research interests cover areas such as education, higher education specifically, and human development, knowledge production, community engagement, and pedagogies at, for citizenship. Dr. Tawa has published widely in international journals and is the author of two books. I will now leave uh, Palesa to introduce herself or introduce her presentation specifically. Thank you for coming and it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Monique. Um, I will begin by sharing my screen. Um, let me know if you can't see that, uh, but we tested the technology before, so it should be fine. OK, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you so much for the invitation from Fanella. Um, thank you, Professor Melanie Walker, for allowing me to you know, participate um, on this platform and talk about a journal article that has yet to come out. Um, so I'm not actually discussing anything related to, to climate today. I'll be talking about um, this paper uh, titled Place the Public Good in Higher Education in South Africa. And this was work that was done on a project that was a collaboration between scholars in four African countries as well as in the UK. So um, the research was funded by the NRF as well as the ESRC, which stands for Economic Social Research Council. The Newton Fund also contributed financially to the project, and the aim was to investigate the public good role of higher education in four African countries, and those were Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. So I have to say also that this particular paper was written with a lot of support from the entire team, um, especially a lot of support from the two principal researchers who were my former supervisor, Stephanie Alais, who's at the Real Center at WITS, and then also um, Elaine Unterhalter, who's at UCL at SEED. Um, so yeah, the journal article will be published in the Journal of Higher Education in Africa. And as soon as it's available, I can send it through for anyone who'd like to read further on this work. To begin, I will outline what I'll talk about today. Um, so I'll start with place and the place-based development kind of uh, area of literature uh, and the role of universities in place-based development. Then I will talk about the public good and the public sphere. So those are the two concepts that I use to frame the discussion in the paper. I'll tell you why I use those comments. And then I'll go into a discussion of the role of universities um, in development under the apartheid government. And then I'll look at the role of universities post-apartheid 
in South Africa, and then I will include, conclude rather. So in the main, then, what I argue in this paper is that there is a process of action that is arising or emerging um, among individuals in universities or groups in universities, as well as some members of communities. And this kind of action plays a central role in defining and contextualizing the public good role of universities um, and the community and those in it is an important public sphere for formulating um, conceptions of the public good. So that's my main argument. And I'll get straight into the first, the first bit of literature that, that I look at in the paper. Um, so this body of literature problematizes the relationship between South African universities and place-based development. Mainly, it suggests that the democratic South African state has failed to prioritize and support the role of universities in contributing to place-based development. So I'll throw out a couple of definitions so that we, we all understand how I'm using uh, these terms. So place-based development refers to the extent to which multi-dimensional development strategies they're multidimensional because they include economic, social, as well as cultural well-being. So these sorts of strategies are relevant and responsive to the specific needs of a spatial location. So that location may be rural or urban. It may be a town. It may be a city, um, whatever. And interventions that are associated with place-based development may be designated or they may be place neutral, non-designated, which means um, similar, if not identical, development strategies are adopted in different places. Um, so in the context of place neutral strategies, these sorts of strategies tend to give very little detailed attention to the specificities of a place. So universities may be understood as engaged in place-based or place neutral development. If it is place based, it takes account of spatial location. If it is place neutral, it underplays, you know, some of those specificities of the region or the locational setting. And this particular kind of orientation may have particular consequences for the relationships that arise between universities and the public good. So I will come back and expand on universities and place based development. I'll go through some specific authors and their positions. But before I do that, I want to elaborate on what universities and place-based development have to do with the public good. Right, so the concept of the public good is often used to connote development. Um, the public good refers to those benefits that wider society enjoys from the expansion of higher education. It includes benefits like economic growth, health outcomes, as well as public debate. There are two distinct ways in which the public good discourse is framed in higher education. The first is, you know, an instrumental public good role, um, and the second is an intrinsic public good role. So the instrumental tends to be more utilitarian in nature. It will include things like developing professionals. In contrast, the intrinsic uh, will be a lot more about a kind of a cultural goods and and the kind of uh, distributing the benefits of that as, the, as a good that arises through the university. So the concept of the public good is helpful to us because it allows us to think about place based development um, in ways that raise a couple of really critical debates, which I can't touch on in this presentation. But one of the big debates is about contextualizing the public good. It is a concept derived from the global north. So the questions are what does the public good look like or how do we theorize it and enact it or practice it in the global south? And that's some of what I bring out in this paper. And within the literature on the public good, there is then a strand within it that segues into, you know, what the role of the public sphere is in shaping the public good. So the public sphere very quickly um, is a concept that is, it's, it's from the work of Habermas, and he discusses the public sphere as a public space where ideas are exchanged, formulated, 
they allow public discourse. Um, and the one thing I want to kind of flag is that the public sphere needn't be spatially bound. But in this particular paper, that's how I work with the concept. So in the abstract, neither neither concept, neither the public good nor the public sphere um, really says much about place based development. But the two notions are useful in reading some of the histories of universities in South Africa, and I'll show you how they are useful. That said, both concepts, so I've mentioned the issues um, around contextualization of the public good. But for both concepts, uh, they are plagued by a couple of analytic limitations. One overarching limitation that is relevant for both is that these concepts may conceal inclusions or exclusions. So they may conceal some substantive issues, issues like who has access to the benefits that accrue to society through the public good and who does or does not participate in the public sphere where the distribution of the public good is deliberated. OK, so after that um, definitional note, I'll get back to the literature on place based development. So I make extensive use of a book titled Anchored in Place, Rethinking the University and Development in South Africa. It's a book written by Bank and a number of scholars contribute to this book, a number of scholars who you will know very well, and they all discuss the inadequacies of the South African democratic state in facilitating the relationship between universities and the communities in which they're located. So the book analyzes different strategies that have been used either by the government or by some universities or groups of individuals in universities in attempts to stimulate place-based development. In addition to the book itself, I refer to some you know, scholars who kind of do work that talks also to this issue. And Fongwa notes that you know, it's quite important to ensure that knowledge institutions are embedded in a, lo a local context. And then Skalkveik and Delange say, well, the institutional embeddedness uh, of universities has to be understood as a product of scholarly engagement, organizational strategies, a coherent policy framework. Ngomo has the kind of perspective that says, well, we need to also ensure that, you know, policy objectives like land reform are met in order to support community based income generating projects. So the argument there is that this can then allow local municipalities and other actors in the community to support the work of place-based development uh, through that relationship with the university. Finally, the various authors, going back to the book, the various authors who contribute to that book contend that place-based development through the public good role of university is made difficult in South Africa by the fact that mutual benefit does not necessarily arise organically from the signing of memoranda of understanding or from single agreements on common interest. Rather, it requires continuous and patient and concerted effort to ensure that realistic goals are set, goals that take into account the capabilities of those partaking in the place-based um, relationship um, but also goals that take into account the responsibilities of all of those actors. So all of this literature for me raises quite fascinating questions about how the public good role of universities is conceptualized and spatially realized by a range of actors within different community con contexts. And the work that my paper does is that it builds on the argument made by Bank et al. Um, and I build on that argument by illustrating how the higher education policy framework formulated post apartheid has inadequately facilitated the development of this um, relationship between South African universities and their surrounding communities. I also build on the work in that book um, by using data from the project that I used in that I introduced in the beginning. And I use that data to demonstrate that the public good is enacted by stakeholders other than the state.
Okay, so this is where I, I start doing the work now of um, looking back at the history of higher education policy in South Africa. And as I go through this history, of course, I'll, I'll weave in as many of the public good debates that I have the time to weave in, as well as the public sphere debates. So um, we're all fairly familiar with the history of apartheid. Um, and when the Nationalist Party came into government in 1948, all segments of society were structured along racial lines and the overarching motivation of all of the policies that propped up the apartheid state was to advance the development of the white republic of South Africa. This meant the inclusion of some and the exclusion of many to this end. So for instance, you know, until 1959, Afrikaans medium universities had traditionally limited admittance to whites only. And then you had the University of the Witwatersrand and the University of Cape Town, which remained open to all races. But Murray, for example, describes the doors of Wits as only half open, as some faculties never admitted black students. You know, so he says most prominently the faculty of dentistry. And by 1953, 1954, Wits had instituted a quota on black students seemingly to improve its, its relationship with the apartheid state. Um, and then the University of Natal admitted students of all races, but segregated its classes. Fort Hare presents a slightly more complex history um, established in 1916. Fort Hare has a very peculiar kind of physical structure because it served as a fort or a stronghold for the British military. So to this day, the ruins that remain are a visible symbol of the strong place-based function of the architecture of Fort Hare. Yet, despite the presence of these ruins as a symbol of both defense and, and exclusion, the university operated as a racially inclusive kind of physical space. That is until um, the 1959, 1960 takeover of the National Party. Thus, one of the many ways in which the apartheid project was unjust was that it involved this uneven distribution of access to higher education and therefore an uneven distribution of access to the public good. And this then had knock on effects economically, politically and culturally for all South Africans um, and how they developed as communities, as individuals etc. Um, and in the main, we all know the apartheid project was to the benefit of a minority population of white people. So as apartheid advanced, so too did some of the policies that were intended to benefit the minority. Um, among many of the, the sorts of aims of higher education policies was, for instance, uh, stuff like addressing the problem of poor whites. So Anyone who's interested can read more in the paper about how the University of Pretoria, the Department of Sociology, actually um, formulated curricula that were aimed at addressing that. And then, you know, 1968, the Rand Afrikaans University is established. Today we know it as the University of Johannesburg. Its aim was to serve an urban Afrikaans speaking population and serve that population by training students um, to keep up with the modern world, especially in fields of industry, media and technology. Now, in contrast, um, the English speaking historically white universities tried to resist the place based functional definitions of their roles under apartheid. So many faculties distanced themselves from making an instrumental public good contribution. In certain respects, some of these universities made themselves accessible in ways that gave public access to cultural public goods, and they fostered what, what I've defined or what the literature defines as the intrinsic public good role of universities. That said, some of these universities had groups uh, of individuals who tried to foster a more instrumental public good role in the university. So for instance, the medical campuses of the University of Natal were very politically active 
perspective, um, the political aspirations of the black medical students included using their education to uplift black people. And these students went as far as criticizing black students on other medical campuses for being too liberal because they, they accused these students of directing their medical education towards lofty or elitist sorts of ends. And now to summarize, we could say that, you know, the divisions between the Afrikaans and the English speaking white universities on the one hand, and then the historically black kind of universities like Forte on the other hand, um, the way in which this terrain kind of emerged left behind something of a binary system um, regarding place and ideas about the public good. Um, and this binary meant that when the democratic state came into power, it kind of had to make the decision of whether higher education policy could be formulated in ways that, you know, remained place based or place neutrally oriented. Um, if the state, you know, worked with a blend of the two, it had a decision to make about the nature and extent of place based versus place neutral policies within its policy framework. Right. So given this binary, then for the democratic state, a first policy choice would require a focus on those who had, because of apartheid, been previously excluded from better developed segments of the university um, and the wider public sphere. This would require supporting the integration of these formerly excluded individuals into a new unified national public sphere. And such policies would, in theory, enable a process whereby um, contextually relevant conceptions of the public good could be derived from members of local communities, from actors in universities as well. The second policy choice would be to promote conceptions of the public good that were in the main place neutral and not necessarily linked to particular contexts and, and responding to the needs of those contexts. So all of that said, I'll now turn to a post-apartheid policy discussion around these two sorts of poles. Right, so in 94, we have a national government of unity that is set up and transformation was centered. Um, uh, that said, transformation was quite underspecified and ambiguous in the way that it was framed. I'll explain, I'll give a quick example of one of the ways in which it was underspecified. And then in 96, a National Commission on Higher Education um, emerges, and this is in order to preserve what, what is valuable, what already exists in the system and is valuable and should be kept going forward, um, but also the Commission have the task of thinking about how to address what is defective and requires transformation. So I've listed all of the actors who were involved in these processes and contestations arose between these different actors and this stemmed from the need to respond to the instrumental forms of public good, which could address enormous challenges of a very unequal society um, but at the same time, there was the need to, to ensure that the vision of an intrinsic public good ideal associated with higher education would also still be, be carried forward. Um, so free speech, critical scholarship and independent research. Um, so this policy document um, and concludes that the instrumental needs that the post-apartheid higher education sector would address um, these needs would be the development of professionals, knowledge workers, but these professionals and knowledge workers would also have globally um, equivalent skills and they'd also be able to, to live and move in society as socially responsible and conscious beings. So the way that the instrumental is framed already, you know, overlaps with some intrinsic idea. 
Um, the document then also goes on to say that the intrinsic public good ideals would be pursued further still by ensuring that academic freedom and the space for universities to lead critical public discourse um, would not be infringed upon. And in, in the attempt to balance these potentially contradictory sorts of demands, the transformation project was formed in this kind of two pronged way. So in addition to the, you know, the overarching instrumental public good and intrinsic public good that that are implied in this policy document, um, there were a number of sorts of areas that were spotlighted as areas that needed focus. And these included governance, funding and quality assurance. So not only were targets established to increase participation rates, but targets were also aimed at seeing to it that program mixes were developed in order to, to meet the, the needs that had been stipulated. In addition, one of the major things was closing the gap between historically white and historically black universities. Um, then in 2001, you have a national plan for higher education, which requires universities to develop and implement um, employment equity acts. By 2008, there was then the Ministerial Committee on Transformation and Social Cohesion, and this identified a range of inadequacies in addressing curricula and knowledge. So I'm not going into details just because I don't have the time. But the focus on increasing participation rates meant an incredible growth rate um, in terms of the numbers of students that were coming into higher education. And the white paper of 2013 stated that the Department of Higher Education and Training would now need to focus on staffing, on retaining academics and ensuring that academic careers were attractive. So remember earlier I said transformation was underspecified and it was quite ambiguously um, positioned. And this is one of the ways in which that underspecification arises. It wasn't clear how academic careers would be made more attractive, right? Um, so certainly transformation was foregrounded, but at the same time in a, in a very loose kind of way. Anyway, to some extent, it could be argued um, that the focus on quality led to a very narrow kind of internal gaze among um, some South African universities. And I'll elaborate on the implications of this kind of internal focus for um, the public good role in place-based development. So all of this history that I've given you is meant to show that different variables determine conceptions of the public good role of higher education. And in this discussion, I've suggested Therefore, that conceptions of the public good change over the course of time. They are dynamic in nature. So, so to take us back to problematizing the focus on the internal affairs and chair, I'm almost done. Um, just another five, seven minutes to take us back to that focus on the internal. Two minutes left. Sorry, Vanessa. But your introduction was three minutes. <laughs> okay, it's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the internal gaze, the internal look kind of um, led to a neglect of the relations between universities and local communities that were outside the campuses. And some people argue that the roads must fall protests were in part a reaction to this, in part. How so? Well, initially, Rhodes must fall drew attention to the, you know, internal affairs as well of universities. It drew attention to the lack of transformation and the physical symbols, statues that represented white history. That that's what was pro problematized. As the movement evolved and spread across the country, it became fees must fall and it took on several more issues, which included, you know, um, student poverty. Uh, these included the exploitation of outsourced workers, the general lack of responsiveness from universities to a range of social issues in the communities around them. And these social issues included drug use in some communities or gender based violence in communities. So through the movement and its line of discourse, students found solidarity with one another, with academic staff, 
um, with workers on their campuses and some community members and students became a source of place based connection between themselves and other actors in this geographically contoured public sphere. So based on this, it seems that the movement can tell us a couple of things about place based conceptions of the public good role of universities and the public sphere and who in that public sphere is included. Now, the data set that I draw from, which is from the projects that I introduced, tells us more still. So very quickly, I'll just say we did about 34 interviews and I'm only focusing on the South African case. So it was 34 interviews in South Africa with a range of actors from unions, government departments, regulatory bodies, civil society, etc. From the data, three main themes arise. OK. So key informants say, well, the reason it appears that there is, isn't this tight relationship between place-based development and universities is one, the lack of coordination from the state, as well as the lack of political will from university management. But then the second theme that arises is that there are pockets of place-based public good interventions that are manifesting. Some of these are formal, others are informal, okay? Finally, the third thing that emerges is this widely circulating idea about the community and each individual's relationship to the community. For instance, the idea around Ubuntu arises and that the full development of one's personhood and personhood is the condition of being an individual. Your personhood and the development of that is embedded in a network of communal relationships and these relationships need to be nurtured as well as harnessed. So I don't have the time to go into detail, but I'll give one example of one quote per theme. Um, so in relation to the issue of the lack of state coordination, one um, respondent, a senior figure in public administration, expressed the importance of state coordination so that innovation policies would meet community needs. He says, we tend to have, you know, a very kind of globalized sense of innovation when really we should foreground problems in the community. Next, a senior official in, no, rather, a uh, representative from civil society, and this was uh, from an organization working on lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transe transsexual, queer, and intersected groups. The activist said most of the work is being done by civil society. When you do see universities making a place-based contribution, it's because we have approached the universities. Then a senior official in government said, you know, that, of course, the public good role is important. And if the distribution of the public good is spread across the network of relationships within a community, then it might it could even be the case that it's fine if some of the outcomes of universities work are not commercially viable. So one of the things he also did was to, you know, criticize the overemphasis on commercially profitable um, outputs from university research. He also stated that, you know, the financial support that black graduates give to their families and communities should not be referred to as something like a tax. We use the term black tax. He said that has negative connotations. It is a good thing that graduates take, you know, their, their private earnings and distribute them among the public. So he's also problematizing that false dichotomy between the public and the private. So I'll summarize and say that the data collected from interviews with key informants shows that the state is perceived as having failed, okay, in fostering that place-based public good role for universities. Participants viewed the initiative for place-based engagement as coming from a few individuals or small groups. Finally, they also considered the public good um, as being something that can be realized if the public sphere includes those who are otherwise excluded. So to conclude, <laughs> this is a very complex case, obviously, um, and you see from the interviews a kind of growing impatience around the more place neutral kind of development policies, uh, you know, that are arising through the state. Um, and through the action that that happens on the ground, um, a more diverse kind of public space arises and it's express, expressed through the concepts of relational personhood, partnership and service 
among other things. And because the impetus for place-based development has come from certain actors and the communities around them, it, it raises certain advantages and disadvantages. The advantage being inclusion, but the disadvantage being that um, it seems universities are expect expected to play every public good role. Um, and we must strike a balance and ensure that universities do not become too parochial as they strive to become relevant and responsive. Secondly, the other issue is that there's not much research available in South Africa on what more place-based interventions actually mean for the core functions of universities. Okay, thank you. Thank you to Palessa. That was an engaging talk. <laughs> and thank you for the, keeping the time. <laughs> These are sexing in their way. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to Timmy right, right now. Timmy, are you with us? Yes. Uh, yes, Monique. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. Can you hear me? You respond and then please, if you have any questions for Palessa, please type them in the comment section and mm. read them out. Mm. Or after Timmy responds, we just mm. get into a discussion. Mm. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Palessa, it's good to see you. Um, uh, after what was that 20, 2018 conference in Free State? And the congratulations for finishing your PhD and uh, for all the development had to have taken place since then. Um, and um, I'm happy to be hearing from you about public good issues of higher education and um, place-based, our anchor institution, which is one of the concepts that me and Sam have been talking about for a while now. And uh, in our recent book, it also came out, um, uh, it featured, uh, and it was nice hearing from you. Um, <laughs> I would like to start my, 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 my response uh, from um, a different note, in a way, um, of looking at what is what, the a core function of a university, whatever they are located, whatever they are located, what are their core function, and how do they navigate between safeguarding those core functions and also being uh, relevant or showing their relevance to whatever they are located to the local milieu. And uh, we, we have many examples of those institutions, the land grant in the US, um, uh, where some of the examples, early examples of uh, one, what one would uh, regard or uh, describe as, as anchor institution, which were very much dedicated to, you know, um, yielding some benefits to the local communities, agricultural innovation, all those kind of things. Um, and I like the way you have mapped the, the trajectory, especially in South African context, uh, prior to 1994 uh, and post-1994, and how that notion has, um, you know, uh, changed the tone and the notion and the understanding of what a university should be doing, whatever they're located, but how history has played out in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, cultural and behavior, you know, operation and functionality, but also the act, 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 <laughs> architectural, you know, outlook of those institutions, but also how society expectation has changed over time. But also, you know, the tension between um, the expectations and what universities are actually doing. And I like that how you have mapped that. But my question ha has always been, you know, um, are universally doing what they should be doing? What has happened that responsiveness concept of universities, you know, uh, which was very strong post 1994 to say universities must be responsive to their local communities, whether they are located, they should. Um, uh, try to engage these communities, you know, you know, what has happened. But when we use this concept of com uh, public good, common good, what do we mean? You know, um, you know, I was reading some um, piece by from Nelson Mandela uh, talking about um, um, the, the techno, te techno, te techn techno rationale times, you know, how it is changing the way universities are behaving, you know, and can universities really be 
a promoter or a contributor of common good within these technical rational times, you know. Um, universities are grappling with many issues, uh, legitimate uh, competition, uh, um, fund, funding cutbacks, you know, um, trying to maintain the prestige, you know, a competition within and outside. But how all those are comparing universities to behave in a certain way, to act in a certain way, which at times is, you know, against the common good, uh, against the fulfillment of human beings and, you know, the community's expectations. So when I was listening to you, I was asking myself, from teaching and learning point of view, you know, how those things may, the common good may, the intrinsic, what do you say, within the place base can be um, uh, achieved, you know, you from student, preparing student point of view, you know, from, you talk about academic freedom, you know, how can that be, you know, uh, 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 looked from a public good point of view, academics really contributing that. Do they, do they take that citizenship role of an academic? You know, from student point of view, are we training that direction? What are we cultivating? You know, within the place we are located, um, you know, are university uh, promoting the change, the values of equity, democracy within the social justice within their location? You know, under what condition are they doing that? So I wanted to hear more of those. Um, I know time was limited and I know you tried to map history and how that has changed, but I would love to hear more of you know, those conversation um, of what has happened to those early expectations of university you know, being more responsive in terms of democracy, in terms of you know, um, the value of cohesion, you know, Ubuntu. And we'll talk about Ubuntu, what kind and how that is happening, you know, from what kind of processes of university? Are they balancing between the internal, you know, inward uh, orientation vis-a-vis -vis outward orientation of, of trying to maintain their core function? And remember, universities are always very rigid to, 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 to those kind of things of trying to maintain the internal processes and uh, um, um, external expectations. So, so in a way, um, um, you know, the place, for me, the place-based concept or anchor institution really give us more expansive way of thinking about what the university can do, you know, within the, local, um, the, the, set, the settings in which they're located. However, I think we need to go beyond that to, to begin to interrogate this notion of public good in terms of what exactly are we talking about. And I, I know there's one paper you and uh, uh, Elaine and, 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 and um, um, Alice, you talk about the indicators, you know, of public, what are those, you know, those intrinsic, from a student point of view, from research you are, you are doing, from engagement, public engagement, what are those indicators that may, you know, um, help us to, to, to begin to say, oh, oh there's public good here. And how that universe look look like? You know, as I say, how would that universe look like you know, wherever they are located, you know? Um, so I would end there and I would just try to pose some questions, but also really um, try to provoke the conversation even more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dimi. Must I respond quickly before we open for questions? Yes, you can. Um, thank, yes, you thank you so much. So I'll just say, Dimi, the thing, the things, the, the issues that you're raising, of course, are issues that I have thought about over the course of finishing the PhD. Do I deal with them extensively in this paper? Not necessarily. The one thing that I do talk about is, you know, there's all of this noise about universities being more responsive. What is their public good role? And like you're saying, at the same time, they are under, you know, the pressure that comes with the cutback in funding um, and the need for them to compete to secure whatever limited funding is available. So all of that exists, yet at the same time, you know, there is a part of the literature Flutie et al. write about the fact that, you know, one major issue that cannot be ignored is that South African universities have what they refer to as a weak academic core. And that they use that term 
to talk about what you are raising, what are the actual main functions of universities, right, in terms of teaching, research, and community engagement? To what extent are universities capable to do the work of fulfilling those functions? And when they say weak academic core, they're talking about a range of things, not just the fact that, you know, research outputs are scant, but there just aren't enough academics in our universities, for example. The staff profile, the number of academics with actual PhDs affects the, um, the academic core, its strength, and thus the ability of the university to perform certain functions. And then Castell says, yes, that's true. Um, and I think he'd worked on this before them. And he said, given that, the more we ask the university to do, um, realistically, is it able to keep carrying out more and more and more and more functions, given that it already seems fairly uh, fragile, for lack of a better term? So I think these, these are questions that I am posing to the group to think with me together about, <laughs> because I don't have answers, right? Um, and then the other interesting debate that arises in relation to the issue of Ubuntu is problematizing Ubuntu and the fact that, you know, communitarianism is juxtaposed with, you know, Western sets of values about individualism and competing. So um, Ogube writes this wonderful book about can Ubuntu coexist, you know, with the Western values that arise from the, you know, traditional university, which depending on your view is, is historically a Western institution, but there are scholars who disagree with that, right? Um, so I think all of these issues intersect in fascinating ways for South Africa, ways that really ask us to think about what a public good looks like, given that we are, you know, we are trying to make normative assessments, whether we admit it or not, about what universities ought to do. Um, and given that, um, what do these concepts help us to do? What don't they help us to do? Um, and yeah, I appreciate your, your response. And it's given me some stuff to go and think about myself. I'll stop there and, and take other questions. Yeah. Our chair is having a uh, problem with Sorry, her microphone, I maybe. You lost me. Oh. <laughs> I think my dad workers think that. Welcome back. Me. Um, does anybody have any other questions? There is nothing in the chat, so most people are in person. Yes, Prof. Walker. Uh, uh, thanks, Monique. Thank you, uh, Felissa, for, for a very interesting paper. I've got two uh, questions which are, perhaps they're quite mundane, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so the first question is, is this whole discourse of the public good, uh, which you, you trace back to apartheid and then post-apartheid days. I suppose the thing that, that puzzles me is that, and maybe what I don't quite understand is, are you looking back in time and seeing transformation as the proxy concept for the public good, because I don't recall the public good as something that was spoken about, um, certainly in, in the 90s, the 80s and the 90s, and maybe it started to come through in the 2000s. So this reading back of the concept into, into these developments, um, what, what are you doing then and what are you trying trying to do then? Is it a proxy for the transformation? Um, that's the one. Um, the second thing relates really to my own, um, uh, I suppose, limitations in trying to grasp quite what is meant by, by place-based. So the, there's a whole literature on universities and regions and universities and cities and you know, the kind of range, you know, it's simply having a university in a particular town or place. 
uh, brings development, it brings people, it brings expenditure, it brings employment and so on. So I guess that's one way of thinking about a, a place-based university. The other, I guess, is perhaps closer to what in Timmy speaking about, and I've, I've not read the bank book, so I, I don't know what the bank and the colleagues are saying, and may or may not be closer to what you're suggesting, which is more about how the university engages with the place in which it's located, however you want to understand place. Um, if, it's, if it's the latter, and maybe it's the former as well, uh, it seems to me that there, there are a range of potential or actual place-based contributions which universities are making for all the, the other sort of uh, challenges that they face in relation to the professionals that they educate in their universities. So for example, nearly all public universities in this country have a law clinic which offers free legal aid. And I've been looking at some of these, and I think their contribution to their local communities is absolutely astonishing. Uh, it's, really, it's really very, very important, and it tends to be funded through a mixture of the university, the law, and the law, the law societies. Um, you've got dental and medical faculty um, students, and I guess medics, who offer free, free clinics um, in poor communities. Um, students uh, work as interns in clinics and hospitals and so on. Um, the same for social workers who work for lo uh, work, uh, social work students who work in local NGOs, uh, work for governments um, and so on. Um, architects, uh, certainly in this university, I can't speak for others, who work on things like low-cost housing projects with the community and so on. So I think that there I, I hesitate with the, the teacher thing. I'm, I'm not going down. I'm not going there. Thank you. Um, so it seems to me that potentially and perhaps actually those professional education spaces and schools and faculties do make a substantial contribution in relation to the university and the place in which it's located. Um, and, and maybe they, you know, they do the other kind of place-based thing as well in terms of the regional, urban, or, or local development. So, so thank you. I think it's very interesting, and I, I look forward to the to the paper, the publication. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Walker. Um, I'll start with your second uh, question. I certainly agree with you, um, and. I think it's also true that there are a number of faculties that are sort of closer to the, the spatial communities that universities are in, and therefore those faculties tend to be able to do the sort of work that makes a, a significant contribution, as you're saying. Um, and not only is there that direct contribution, right, from law clinics or, you know, whomever else that you've identified, there are also just the some of the more indirect benefits just of having a university in a city. So having students living in res, if they move through the city, they are stimulating the economy, they're spending money. That's an argument for the place based contribution of universities. Um, and the argument is that that is quite a strong contribution, regardless that it's indirect. In addition to that, there is the fact of, you know, universities require infrastructure the maintenance of that infrastructure creates work both on the campus and off the campus so i certainly agree with you that there there is a lot to be said about universities about what universities do contribute to places spatially um, i think what my paper is trying to suggest is that there are ways in which a more kind of um bottom up uh public sphere role uh, is emerging uh, and that requires you know some thinking about the ways in which that that changes some of the place-based contributions that other actors make in the public sphere and then of course there's the difficulty of measuring those contributions so like Ndimi said Tristan and I have written on a public good indicator where we're, me we're not measuring, sorry, we don't measure. 
we, we're stating that it is important to bear in mind that that which can be measured still matters. So solidarities um, and considering safety on campuses, um, those are some of the, the things that we bring into the indicator. So I guess the aim of my work is to is to build on what we know is happening um, with law clinics or other sorts of whatever um, actors on universities, plus the indirect benefits of student spending and infrastructure development, plus now this more and more inclusive kind of public sphere. I don't know that the act that the paper actually does that, that it achieves that. You can read it and let me know. And maybe I need to write another paper that, you know, does a little bit more of that kind of discussion and presents more nuance. Um, and then to your second point, <laughs> transformation. Yes, um, you are correct. And I failed to mention this in my paper. I, I think there are a number of terms that I'm using as proxies because they connote. Um, so I said the public good connotes development. And then there are um, terms like transformation, which connote a public good role. Although, yes, it wasn't ever stated explicitly in policy documents um, that the, the public good was being foregrounded. I think the public good helps us to understand the ambiguity around transformation, you know, so some of that literature uh, by like um, scholars like Wangenge Omar, who says, yes, the numbers have increased, but at the same time, the increase in participation has created new inequalities, you know, um, so the transformation discourse uh, fleshes out um, or problematizes rapid expansion in ways that uh, I think we haven't necessarily thought about when when using the language of transformation. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, I thought my mic was on. I wanted to ask if there's any other question from anyone else. Okay, if um, no questions for now, we just give Palace a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Palace. It was an honor to hear from you, especially us who um, first met you when you were still doing the PhD, doing the PhD um, conference, and to catch up on everything. Oh, Timmy, you wanted to introduce somebody? Okay, <laughs> I thought you wanted to introduce someone. Um, thank you again, and congrats on your full doc and your new research. We look forward to hearing you, hearing from you again in future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, you're muted. And again, I really appreciate. Okay, I'm not. No, you're sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate the, the platform and I welcome any comments via email or any further discussions about the paper. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great <laughs> rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.